after preaching, I would feel more like one dead than alive and could sometimes scarcely walk across the room. Now, this lasted 13 years. And I want to tell you what happened in the changing of the situation to break this, because it, it shows God's hand upon this man's life and his interpretation of God's chastisements in his own life. Thirteen years now, he labors under this physical distress, whatever it was. 1819 now, here we are 13 years later, he's on a visit to Scotland. He has pressed on faithfully in the ministry during these 13 years. As he crosses the border into Scotland, he says that it left him. The weakness left him. And here are his words. It was almost as percept I was almost as perceptibly revived in strength as the woman was after she had touched the hem of our Lord's garment. Now, what was his interpretation of this 13 year period? Listen to this. It seemed to me that God was saying, quote, quoting God now. I laid you aside because you entertained with satisfaction the thought of resting from your labor at 60 years old. But now you have arrived at the very period. He was 60 now when, when he was healed. Now you have arrived at the very period when you had promised yourself that satisfaction and have determined instead to spend all the rest of your strength for me to the latest hour of your life. And I have doubled, trebled, and quadrupled your strength that you may execute your desire on a more extended plan. And so for 17 more years, he preached and labored, and he interpreted those 13 years as God's chastisement for a planned retirement at 60 years old. Now, that's enough on the trials, perhaps, to give you a feeling. Uh, it's the kind of thing, these are not, these are not martyr trials in the sense of uh, he, he was about to be killed, although there was one or two times, there were one or two times when that was true. So these are things you can identify with, I hope. These are the kinds of trials that we all will go through. Now, the question is, where did he get the resources to endure? What were the, the, the traits of his spirituality and his uh, interaction with people? And what was the root of those traits? So I've got about eight traits and then a root and then the root. Okay, number nine will be the root of those eight traits, and number ten will be the root beneath the root. Trait number one. What these are, are the characteristics of Simeon that I think enabled him to weather this kind of, of trial. Number one. Simeon had a strong sense of his accountability before God for the souls of his flock, whether they liked him or not. A strong sense of accountability for the souls of his flock. Listen to this excerpt from a sermon in his very first year as a young man preaching to the people standing in the aisles of his church. Remember the nature of my office and the care incumbent upon me for the welfare of your immortal souls. Consider whatever may appear in my discourses harsh, earnest, or alarming, not as the effects of enthusiasm but as the rational dictates of a heart impressed with a sense both of the value of the soul and the importance of eternity. By recollecting the awful consequences of my, elect, of my ne neglect, you will be more inclined to receive favorably any well-meant admonitions. So that phrase, the awful consequences of my neglect, is what he had in his mind that I think prevented him. He told a story one time to them about a lighthouse keeper who went to sleep and described the shore strewn with mangled bodies and weeping widows and orphans. 
And the person who was telling the story 30 years later said, I can remember to this day the resounding word through that hall, asleep! And how it just sank in to the pastors and the young men who were there that this pastor might go to sleep in his charge. Number two, his preaching in the midst of conflict was free from the scolding tone. Free from the scolding tone. How many times have we fallen victim to ourselves or heard pastors preach in such a way that you wonder, who is he talking to? Who is he upset at in the congregation? Or, uh, hmm. In other words, he's letting his vindictiveness about one person or a group show in a scolding tone toward the congregation. Moole, in his biography, said he was totally free from that easy but fatal mistake of the troubled pastor, the scolding accent. Joseph Gurney saw the same thing, and he said uh, that alongside Simeon's private weeping, it was one of his grand principles of action to endeavor at all times to honor his master by maintaining a cheerful and happy demeanor in the presence of his friends. Now, I can imagine somebody saying, but that's called hypocrisy, isn't it? If you're broken inside and weeping over the distress of your situation and you maintain a cheerful demeanor outside. But let me at least put beside the possibility of hypocrisy, Matthew six seventeen. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by men. Is that hypocrisy? Third, Simeon was no rumor tracker. Rumor tracker, that's my phrase, not his. Charles Simeon, I mean uh, Spurgeon, came a little later, had great, a great lecture he gave to his students, remember it, called The Blind Eye and the Deaf Ear. Great, great lecture. Every pastor must have one blind eye and one deaf ear. And whenever there's a rumor, he just turns like this to it. Puts, puts his deaf ear to the rumor. And uh, Simeon said, my rule, he was asked in 1821 how in the world he had handled a situation where he had been slandered so grievously and he had not been retaliatory. He said, my rule is never to hear or see or know what if heard or seen or known would call for animadversion from me. Hence it is that I dwell in peace in the midst of lions. Isn't that great? My rule is never to hear or see or know what if heard or seen or known would call for animadversion, acrimony, you know, bitterness, from me. Hence it is that I dwell in peace in the midst of lions. In other words, he just resolved not to listen. In this church, for example, my church, I'll tell you the phrase that makes my deaf ear kick in and my blind eye go shut at the beginning of a sentence. If I hear a sentence that begins with, a lot of people are saying, I turn it off. Because if they're saying it, they better come to me or I do not want it secondhand. It does nothing but cause turmoil in this soul, which doesn't isn't necessary, all right? It's a skill you have to develop, I think. It doesn't come by human nature. <laughs> Number four, Simeon dealt with his opponents in a forthright, face-to-face -face way. Edward Pearson accused Simeon in 1810 of having a, a standard of holiness in his preaching that was unrealistically high. And he took him to task in pamphlets publicly. Here was his response in a letter to, to uh, Pearson. 
uh, persons who have the same